Hello listeners and welcome to the Monto Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we will discuss the impact of the massive growth of renewables, primarily solar power, in the Netherlands and the wider Northwest European region. We will also talk about the ways in which small producers and consumers of green energy can be brought to market in the most efficient way. And, of course, how they can help to keep the grid in balance and ease congestion. Helping me, Richard Sverson, to discuss this and much, much more are Mikael Lensink of ETPA and also joining us is our own John Paul Harriman. A warm welcome to you guys. Thank you. Thanks. I think we can expect quite a Dutch episode, uh, and then obviously we're focusing on on mainly issues affecting the Dutch market. But before we go into into um, the main issues in the Netherlands and the wider region, of course, um, what what is Etpa, uh, Mikael? W- where is it active? What do you do? Yeah, so Etpa is uh, the newest uh, Nemo, newest power exchange uh, in the in the Nemo constellation. Uh, we went live uh, last year, um, and what we do, we, we are active in the spot market. And what Adpa does, we compete obviously against uh, companies like Epex and Nordpool, uh, but we are very strong in the smaller players. So we have a, a, a new technology stack uh, that's very fast, but it also really uh, enables smaller energy players to also become active in the power market. Mm. And uh, why why is that important in your view? Yeah, I think we will be discussing a lot of this uh, today. But uh, obviously, what we've seen is that, you know, from from very centralized uh, um, production of energy, we have gone to a very decentralized system. And I think that um, it also we also need the smaller players to help balance the grid because I think that's by far our biggest challenge in the coming years. Mm. And I, I'd just like to say as well that uh, Montel News was the first to report on your entry into the market back in 2016 um, when we talked to one of your, your predecessors. Um, but okay, I'd like to discuss that a little bit further later on. But before, what let's talk about the context in which we find ourselves. Um, John Paul, what's currently the situation in the Netherlands and in the region? I'm thinking here in terms of you know the growth, as I said, in the intro of, you know, particularly solar and how is that impacting both the Dutch market and the German, Belgian and the French? Yes. Um, So one of the main topics we've seen over the past months is, of course, negative prices. Uh, So we have seen uh, enormous growth in uh, solar development, both in the Netherlands, but also in Germany. Uh, France is starting to develop as well. So we're seeing an immense increase in renewable capacity. Um, and this is affecting uh, markets because a lot of that capacity is behind the meter. So there's no on-off button. Uh, it will just generate at any price. And basically, it pushes down uh, power prices across Europe. And yeah, this is um, not a typically Dutch problem, but it is a very, very severe problem in the Netherlands because of regulations where we have net metering, which allows us to, um, as a consumer, to, to net off uh, summer summer solar generation versus winter consumption. And of course, that's not how power markets work. So that causes an issue in uh, in timing. Mm. And, and you've seen this year or last year a record number of, of negative prices or the occurrences of, of these prices when they go below zero, where effectively users are being paid to use power, as you said. Absolutely, yes. And keep in mind that this spring or this, yeah, well, we're in June now and it still feels like October, but um, we've had a very poor uh, first six months of the year, uh, solar-wise. So the the load factor, the utilization of solar has never been as low as now since we've measured. So yeah, we've been measuring since 2015. So it could have got could have been much worse um, had we had some good weather, which is a contradiction. But yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, so we're seeing poor weather, very Dutch weather, and um, yeah, if the weather would have been a bit better uh, we would have had a lot more solar a lot more negative prices but also and this is what you were alluding to i think was um the congestion um so in the dutch grid like all european countries uh the grid was designed uh, to flow power from large power stations um all the way down to smaller and smaller connections into consumers 
Um, but with all of this solar development uh, on people's rooftops, the, the flow of power is uh, starting to go the other way. Um, and that's not what systems were designed for, and that is causing congestion, and not only on, um, on a high voltage level, but also in distribution grid level. And so, yeah, distribution companies are basically struggling to get power from A to B, and um, this is uh, causing a lot of issues in uh, in the market. Mm. And I think it's quite interesting what you're saying there, John. Was like you know, we thankfully it hasn't been that sunny, so the solar, the full solar panels haven't solar panels haven't come into to full operation. We could maybe expect uh, more issues uh, in the coming months. But before we talk about some of the solutions or potential ways of remedying the situation, let, let, I'll bring you in here, um, Michael. And what what what? How does Etpa come in here? And what what does it roll in? terms of maybe helping the system to balance or to ease some of the congestion here yeah yeah i think uh, uh, the two issues that that jean paul mentioned are, are separate right so um uh, so first of all on the negative prices i think uh, like jean paul said it will get much 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 worse right so there's it's an exp- exponential growth in netherlands in 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 solar and wind and i think um you know we this is just the inflection point um, in terms of congestion, so in the past, Edpa built uh, what Copax, which is the Dutch uh, congestion uh, platform, and indeed, uh, it was used in the past mostly only for on the high voltage uh, lines. And we've seen actually that Tenet has solved some of that problems on the north south uh, uh, connections, and and it, it has become a much bigger issue in in the uh, in the decentralized. And the reason for that is that it's quite easy; re- it's relatively easy to solve high voltage congestion because they're they're you know uh, it doesn't really matter the regional spread where you can ramp up and down is quite large. But if you want to do it on a regional level, actually you need assets all over the place, and uh, and that is creating the chicken and egg problem. As long as you don't have those assets that you can ramp up and down, it's very difficult to do it through an exchange. Um, and as long as there's no money to be made, people will not join, right? So so we are actually right now at a, in a position that um, for the first time DSOs actually realize that this will not be solved in the next 10 years by having more copper in the ground. I mean, for a long, long time, that was their position. It still needs to happen, don't get me wrong. But um, just to give you a flavor, it sometimes takes seven to eight years to get a connection if you want to electrify your industry. It is. And so this is having a huge impact in our on our economy. So it, what we need right now and what we provide as at so GoPax is something that we built in the past. It's now owned by a separate uh, group. We gave access to GoPax. And what we need is more people becoming active in GoPax so that we can leverage that uh, flexibility because that's the only the only solution on the short term. Mm. But what, I mean, John Paul, surely the incentives, as you said, the incentives are not there for people to, to ease the production or to turn it off. So they, they're just sort of pumping it into the system and surely maybe that needs to be looked at. Yeah, so the yes. incentive is not there because they're, the platform uh, didn't have enough players and because they didn't have enough players, the DSO would not actually use it a lot. Uh, and they complain that the, the, the prices are too high. But obviously, there, I mean, there's always a, a period when you need adjustment, right? And, and uh, to be fair, uh, last month was the, the highest uh, use of, of uh, GoPax uh, ever uh, by the DSOs. But we need to increase that drastically. And uh, to do that, uh, people m- need to be able to make money to offer their flexibility. Uh, and, and we need more people on board. Yes, no, that's that's absolutely correct. So, um, and what is important for uh, for players once they have the ability to um, to make money is also that they that they have an idea on when are when I'm when am I going to be called on? Um, and this is a, a project that we've recently done with uh, with one of the the DSOs um, where we actually do a congestion forecast for a specific area which basically means uh, we we forecast sort of a transmission prognosis for the area involved and then um, yeah when when boundaries are about to be be reached we send out an, we, we send out an alert 
And um, yeah, the idea is then to also involve the public, uh, not just uh, companies or marketplaces, but also the public to um, yeah to to become more aware of. Look, we have we are producing energy. We should use it now, not later. So it, it is the behavior change that is actually needed in the whole power system, where we match um, our consumption to uh, when generation is available. Kind of the reverse uh, uh, we had in the, in the past, where we had a consumption forecast and generation would be scheduled to meet that consumption forecast. Unfortunately, the sun is not schedulable. Otherwise, we don't, would have had a lot better weather in the Netherlands in the in the spring. Um, so, so, so this is uh, this is a ma- major challenge, um, and and uh, yeah, as as an example, this is living in in society. So recently, we we, we provided data to um, to a student who um, who had a, a funny funny way of involving the the, the public in um, helping to manage the grid, which is basically uh, an app saying, "Is it apple pie day today?" and he, based on energy prices uh, and congestion forecasts, he uh, he calculated when was the best time to bake apple pie. And yeah, surprisingly, it's mostly on Sunday mornings, so it's very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> to make apple pie for for Sunday lunch, you know, have it as a dessert. But I, I, you know, what you're talking here about here. John Paul, is really a fundamental transformation in the way that we use electricity in the household sector. So you would look at the forecast of the weather and say, okay, on Wednesday, I'll charge my car on Tuesday and Thursday and Wednesday, maybe Friday, I'll do my washing for the week. So you, you're altering consumer patterns based on on the weather, pr- pretty much. Is that Would that be a fair assumption there, John Paul? Yes, it's a fundamental change uh, for the whole of society, uh, if you if you think about it. And to add to add to that, I, I don't believe we should leave it to personal people's actions, right? So you need to automate this; otherwise, it it, it will not uh, work. So I think price signals, and that that's what exchanges do, uh, and forecasts um, uh, have to to uh, lead a lot of the processes that we have. And I, and I think when we speak about flexibility, we tend to think a lot on production and things like that that obviously are flexible. A lot of things in our lives are flexible by definition, right? When we charge our cars, when the washing machine goes on, um, when our heater goes on. So there's a lot of stuff and, and the technology is out there. I think I, I just believe that we have not realized we were so focused in putting on uh, solar panels on our roofs. And we have not realized enough, or at least not not acted upon it, uh, that the consequences um, would be so severe. And, and I believe for the first time, um, there might be outages uh, in our system if this gets out of hand. So this this, this is quite pressing, and um, and 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 uh, but also we're quite exciting, right? So we are we you know uh, when I started at a year ago, the world looked different than it d- does today. It's it really changing in, at a very, very high speed. It's uncharted territory. And as you say, maybe blackouts or outages across the system will force uh, politicians or policymakers to make a change, but uh, hopefully in the right direction. But uh, the other question would be, you know, uh, at times of oversupply and when the the system is overloaded, John Paul, isn't this also something that would interest people in, you know, batteries, batteries energy storage, you know, uh, these kind of solutions? These are part of the, the flexibility um, issues that, that uh, Mikhail is talking about. Yes, absolutely. So... Um what what is crucial is that you have those decentralized flexible assets uh, in uh, across the grid and um there there's quite a lot of initiatives uh, going on um for battery investment um there's a lot of uh, arguments to say why the netherlands is not the best market to invest in batteries but there are also a few very good ones um which are congestion and um uh, and and good price spreads because of the the delta between uh, solar generation and the evening peak when uh, conventional power plants have to start up uh, to fill demand. Uh, So that creates large price deltas. Um, So I believe Netherlands is a very interesting market for batteries and uh, congestion markets can really help um, solidify the business case because it's, it's, um, it's a market that's not 
got a lot of data yet. Um, so it's very difficult to include in business cases. So in, in, in principle, we either make an assessment or we say it's, it's an upside to a business case. But the size of that upside is considerable. And I think, um, yeah, well, it is like EDPA facilitating small market players, but also facilitating GoPacks, which is the congestion uh, solution that's put in place. This combination is a very strong um, driver for, for, those, for those parties to actually also be active in that. I totally agree on that, uh, Jean-Paul. And what we see from battery players is that, let's say, one or two years ago, they, the whole business case was only about frequency regulation. And, and, and now, uh, actually, intraday trading is, is a big chunk of that already. Uh, and then if you add go back, so I, I believe there's a, a fundamental change in how batteries should be operated where you have multiple business cases and where you choose where to play depending on the situation. And, and that really adds to um, the business case of a battery. And uh, unfortunately, in the Netherlands, we have not seen the level of home batteries as we, as, as you see in Germany. I think um, the, the 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 system of grants in the Netherlands is very focused on solar, only on the on the panels and not not on um, on home ownership of a battery. But that might change in the future. And uh, as you said, um, there are more batteries uh, coming. But the irony is that because of congestion. Um, there's also little place to install them uh, because the lines are not uh, uh, not, not big enough. So uh, there's there there's some uh, challenges to, uh, to 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 overcome there. Exactly. Now that that is also part of the study we did for uh, for this uh, grid operator in Netherlands, where we actually said, okay, what is the ideal profile for a battery in this grid? What's what's the limitation that you um, impose on a battery, and how do, how much impact does it have on his on his revenues because that could be a bilateral contract for a service between uh, a dso and a battery uh, operator and of course then it would become available for uh, for either limiting or solving uh, congestion but it has to fit in the transmission capacity of the area and having this tool that we built uh, now we can sort of um, uh, simulate uh, market-based patterns into uh, a grid load and that's uh, that's very cool to do absolutely and of course the netherlands you know it's not known for its its space you know it's not uh, it's uh, it's a sort of heavily densely populated area i mean you can't sort of have floating batteries on the dikes or something could you no i mean that's uh, maybe a step too far yeah, it's very very few, very few things float on dikes uh, Richard. <laughs> the problem is not necessarily the, the the area of where to put the batteries but the capacity of the grid and uh, so i mean that in houses you could put it and but uh, the, the grid capacity is the limiting factor here and 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 I I heard a very interesting story why that is. So we had have had in the past a lot of gas. So our grid and we so we heat our houses with gas. So our grid was not as extensive as in Germany and France, where they also use energy for uh, um, for heating of houses. So our whole grid system is just not as strong. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, of course, the clue going forward would be seasonal storage. That would be the answer here. But uh, we're quite a long way off that, aren't we, uh, John Paul? Mm. Yes. And especially in the Netherlands, where we don't have any mountains. So anything seasonal would uh, would have to come from abroad. Yeah, I know. Or or the technology would have to make massive, uh, massive progress. Um, yes. And I, I think, um, you know, the, there are a, a lot of issues here. But how do you get the small players into the market, Mikia? How, how do you get them to come in? And and Because, and, you know, I don't know, it reminds me a little bit of um, the discussion a few years ago around blockchain when you're talking about peer-to-peer -peer trading. Is is that now completely out the window and now you're looking at sort of platforms like uh, like your own one? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think when, when the exchanges were started, they, they were um, actually, there were quite a limited of people, a number of, uh, of people trading, right? So the utilities and there were yet some prop traders. And the whole system is geared towards those large players. So you need a lot of collateral, you need uh, bank guarantees, and the, the, the whole IT system is quite old fashioned. So uh, what we do differently uh, in many ways is, you know, obviously we build an IT stack uh, like everyone would build if they had the luxury luxury of doing it today. So it's 
uh, in the cloud, uh, many pods that can ramp up and down, it's extremely flexible, very modern APIs. So all these new players are like us, also IT players, right? This is an IT play, and we are an IT player compared to the other uh, large exchanges that have much more old-fashioned uh, uh, technology. The second one is cash. So um, the amount of cash that you need to trade uh, is is the, the way that, that the other exchanges do that. They, they, they looked at the financial sector and they copied that. They're also owned by large, uh, that Euronex and, and, and Deutsche Börse. We look at cash in a very different way. You have a wallet, you, you deposit money, even if it's a thousand euros, and you can start trading. Uh, and we do direct settlement. So if you sell something, you get the money direct, directly. So the amount of cash that you need when you trade at EPA compared to uh, at EPEX or Nordpol is about 70% less. And um, those two aspects, so the, the IT aspect and the cash aspect, is, is uh, really lowers the barrier to entry for new players. And I think that's very important. I mean, these are, you know, we need to get new business models. We need to experiment. We need to start um, uh, trying out new new concepts. And uh, if you can only do that, if you're a very big player and, and it takes a year to onboard where with us, it takes a week to onboard. Um, uh, and those are the aspects that are important for this market. Uh, so, so that's how we do it. We really try to lower um, the barrier to entry and uh, to allow new players, players to, uh, to be active as well. Mm. And how 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 is it in terms of liquidity? How are you building up into, and how does it compare with other intraday platforms? Uh, yeah, you? the beauty of it is that uh, five years ago the European Union mandated that uh, the exchanges uh, um, have a shared order book. So we co-own the order book with um, Nordpol and uh, Epex. So our liquidity is hundred percent the same as they have. So um, if you come and trade with us, uh, it's cheaper, you need less cash, it's faster, and you have the same liquidity. Mm. What's not to like? <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, EPEX are not pull on on this pod, so they can't sort of give maybe the contrary position, which I'm sure they will. But uh, but maybe that's for another another pod, Mikhail. But you've made your point and made it very well. Um, uh, John Paul, I just I'd like to t- continue what we were talking about earlier about the the and the negative prices. Okay, we've been lucky on the Netherlands that it hasn't been that sunny, but what if July, August and and September? What are your expectations here? And like uh, Mikael said, it's going to get far far worse, you know. What we, is this going to be negative prices every Sunday, every time when, you know, there's a bit of a public holiday and it's a sunny day? Yeah, that that's sort of what we've seen so far. Uh so that that will probably continue. Um, usually, uh, if we look at past years, uh, July, August are relatively quiet in terms of negative prices. Uh, and the reason for that is that wind is usually absent, uh, during those months. Um, yeah, it, it depends what, what, what summer will do. Um, it, it's not looking like it's going to be a massively, uh, interesting summer in terms of solar. Um, the wind will probably also not be there. So I, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to explode uh, unless the weather massively improves. Um, our prognosis is still around 600 hours of negative prices uh, for this year uh, for Netherlands, Germany. So that looks um, kind of um, kind of kind of similar. Um, but something else that we do see, and that is in in light of what Edpa does, maybe also quite interesting, is um, that balancing risk is going up. So one of the things we're seeing in uh, speci- specifically for, for the Netherlands is these dual balancing prices. So there's a price for positive uh, imbalance, a price for negative imbalance. And whatever imbalance position you have, it's always bad because it's always much worse than market price. Um, so we have seen slightly more than, uh, than in previous years. And the reason for that is that the Dutch system allows um, for passive balancing. So that's market parties helping to balance the system uh, by using price incentives as uh, as published by the TSO. The problem is, if too many people do that, they flip the balance the other in the other direction. The TSO splits the prices and everybody loses. Um, so this is an issue um, because due to the amount of solar in the system, and the, and the spreads between high solar and low solar periods in, in market prices, you see a very high spread also in the balancing market for upward and downward regulation. And the more speed 
the TSO needs to to ramp uh, reserves up and down. Um, yeah, the faster they get to the end of the merit order, and this is a real issue in in the Dutch market. So people have contacted me saying, "What, what can we do to tackle this risk?" Um, and one of the easy ways to do it is just trade out your imbalance on uh, on ETPA. Uh, sorry, ATPA. And I'll let Michiel explain how that works. So yeah, so Michiel, how how would that how would that work? How what's your view here? And you can explain how it would work in practice if you have that uh, balancing risk where you either have too much or too little power, and you have to you know you have to um, and deal with the TSO there, or or, or pay a very hefty uh, fine and uh, and and balancing uh, fees. You know, I agree with Jean Paul that there's a fundamental issue to be solved, right? So it it used to work very well in the Netherlands passive in, uh, imbalance, but um, uh, we are overshooting a bit. Uh, so what we have, we have an exposed market. So um, after gate closure, 10, 15 minutes after gate closure, uh, people can trade their imbalance if it is a regula- regulatory state two. So a regulatory state two is when you have a up and downwards uh, price for uh, for imbalance. And actually, you can meet in the middle. And what we've seen is a, a growth in the um, uh, in the percentages. So it used to be about 8% of the quarters used to be a uh, regulatory state two. It's slightly higher now. But uh, the, the spreads have gone up, um, so there's a lot of trade now exposed to mitigate that cost, right? So you can actually, if you have the imbalance on one side and and uh, someone else the other side, you can actually uh, trade that, and it, and it, it's a very uh, liquid uh, liquid market. So there's a lot of trading going on. It has increased considerably this year, uh, and last year the average uh, savings. Uh, in top mind, 185 per megawatt hour euro per megawatt hour. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's quite substantial. That's that's quite a bit, absolutely. I I'd, I'd like to kind of I think you know we're we're going to obviously the the world we are coming into is always going to be there's not going to be any less decentralized. So you're going to have to see some of these solutions, the flexibility, the aggregators, the batteries come into the market and a platform in which they could could, could do this on. You know. Uh, conduct trading from their portfolio. Um, John Paul, I'd just like to round off by asking you, um, you know, what, what keeps you awake at night, you know, uh, in, in these markets? What, 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 what are your main concerns here? Main concerns are, are uh, not well thought through policy changes. Uh, I mean, yeah, politicians can come up with crazy ideas like uh, net metering in, in Netherlands um, and, the first few years, it looks like it's working perfectly, and then suddenly you find out, oh, we made a design error, and now the market's uh, the market's not not able to cope anymore. Um, so yeah, so that that that's what keeps me awake, um, and and basically thinking about solutions, and it's, it's good to have like smaller, you know, innovative uh, players in the market uh, that 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 think alike and that have similar approaches to looking at those issues. So, John, if I could stick with you and say, what would your wish for the policymakers be then? Give me a call. Give me a call, I guess. <laughs> One wish. I'm happy to think along. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you. <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. But um and, and I can ask you the same, Mikia. What 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 keeps you awake at night? Yeah, um I think first of all, this is extremely complex. And I think Jean Paul, uh, I'm always very impressed with your knowledge, but it's not something people get very easily. So and and um, and it's changing. So it's not it is it was already complex, but then also it's changing very fast. And um, uh, so I think it's quite hard for policymakers to to keep up with what's needed. Um, at the end of the day, like you said, decentralization will not go away. Um, and I believe that uh, no, we 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 have an inherent um, risk that the market does not adapt fast enough, and that will lead to big issues. And uh, where two three years ago I thought maybe you know I would I would think hydrogen is not a solution, which with the negative prices it, at some point it might be interesting, right? So uh, um, even even things that were not interesting a few years ago. It's, it's, it, it, it might become interesting in the future. And, and I don't know if you heard, but the new Dutch government now says they're, they're going to build um, uh, nuclear power. It's exactly the opposite of what we need, right? So we need flexibility in our grid. 
uh, it will not really solve uh, solve our issues. Um, so what keeps me at night is that 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 um, uh, I think it will get worse. I mean, we we had we come from a luxurious position where you can always have power whenever you switch on uh, electricity, and I think that will change. And we already seen that. I mean, the, 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 I, I mentioned seven to eight years for a factory to get a um, a, a connection. Um, right now, uh, areas are not being built because of congestion. And I, I have, I don't think um, the public has realized what that effect will be on our on our society, and uh, we really need need to tackle this. Uh, it's obviously a very, very, very complex area, area, and uh, for the, the the public at large, uh, way above. Um, often it's way above my head, so sometimes I'm sure it's way above the the public's head as well. But would you would you agree, Mikael, that the the policymakers and regulators should give Jean Paul a call? What, if in doubt, I, I think anyone in the energy space should give Jean Paul a call. Uh, um, <laughs> and the, at the other hand, what we see is that we, you know, we are also part of the system, right? So uh, I do think policymakers do reach out. I mean, we, we talk to to policymakers uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, at the other hand, uh, a decentralized system also needs a decentralized solution. So uh, at the end of the day. Um, even though uh, I'm very pro uh, a more socialist society, making money out of the problem is the solution. Uh, so, 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 um, giving a price to the problem, like with congestion, like with negative price. So, if, let the negative prices be and see if there are other business cases around it. Right. So, that's at the end of the day, that will that is the only solution we have. I, I don't think, you know, and we should expand our our capacity obviously on the grid. Um, that goes without saying. But that's a 10, 20 year project you know it, it, the problem is it will be here in the coming years is already here maybe coming months even jumper would you agree yes i do um and i do want to put one defensive word in for the grid operators so one of the one of the policies that backfired um in in the past is the fact that uh, to keep grip grid fees low for uh, the public and for companies um, and grid operators were not allowed to invest proactively um, and now everyone is saying well why didn't you invest for earlier you did see people building solar and wind um, it's because they weren't allowed to so it's also policy gone bad basically i mean that's an important point as well um Gentlemen, we've, we're running out of time. Um, a fascinating discussion to be continued, I'm sure. Um, thank you for, for a very interesting and insightful Dutch episode. Thank you, Jean-Paul, and thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Thank you for having me.